Hey, y'all know tomorrow is Valentine's Day? Yes. <laughs> that was good. Y'all, I'm telling on the first service, but I said it and it was like, oh, oh, oh. I think it was mostly some husbands out there. I was sharing with uh, the first service that I, it's terrible of me, but I love going to Kroger. You can go to Publix as well or any of these places, but go there tomorrow around five. <laughs> you will see some men. Some of them will be you. I'm telling you now. Go ahead and get there. I already started, y'all. I got Shauna, love, my wife, she loves these chocolate chip cookies from uh, Kroger. And so I went there and they're on display there. And I was like, can I take one of these? So I grabbed one. I'm like, is this on display? And no, oh, you can have it. I'm like, my wife's going to be so happy because on Monday they won't be there. Now, they'll be gone. So y'all go get some of those today at your local uh, grocery stores. Uh, support them, but also uh, it's a great way uh, to go ahead and get started. So, you know, tomorrow is Valentine's Day, and some of you are like, that's great. Others of you are like, no, don't tell me you're going to be talking about Valentine's Day. Blah, you know, I don't want to hear about that. Um, we're going to talk about it, and, the, and really not Valentine's Day, but we're going to use the opportunity on this Hallmark holiday, it's not a Christian holiday, but a Hallmark holiday, to talk about love and romance and especially marriage. So if your relationship status is dating, like to be dating, engaged, like to be engaged, married, like to be married, all right, any of those, then this is for you today. All right, if you're not any of those things, uh, it's also for you. It will be helpful because what I'm going to talk about today will apply to all relationships, but I especially want to apply it uh, to those love relationships and especially uh, to marriage relationships. I also want to say this. If you're young, all right, I'll let you decide that. <laughs> you need to hear what I'm talking about today. I mean, young people should be leaning forward in their seats on this, for real, because I'm going to share something with you that is important to marriage, all right? And too often, those of us who are married take too long to understand these things and start to get them right, and we never get them perfectly right, but you need to hear what I'm saying. And even if you haven't seen this modeled, I'm here to tell you that what I'm talking about today is important, and it's what God would want for your relationship should you end up in one and be... Well, you don't end up in one. I hate to say it that way. <laughs> should you uh, decide uh, to be married. So in, in premarital counseling, I always teach a concept that I want to share with you today. So a lot of times that's young married folks or almost married folks, um, engaged that is, uh, come to me and, and we do premarital counseling. We talk through some concepts. And the first time we get together, I always tell them, look, marriage should look like this. And I give this picture of, of marriage. And it's like, it's like grandiose, man. It's like all these amazing things. Like in marriage, you should have unconditional love. And they're looking at me like, oh my gosh, how are we going to do that? In marriage, uh, you should uh, have steadfast love, which means consistent love. And they're like, oh gosh, sometimes I struggle and it's up and down. In marriage, you get married for the benefit of the other person, not for your own benefit. And they're like, are you serious? Like I'm getting married for me. <laughs> like that person makes me happy. So it's all all these things that couples go, I don't know, wait. It, and then I say this, I go, but none of that's going to happen. None of that's possible without this last thing that makes it very practical. And so I'm giving everybody here some premarital counseling advice, all right? Some hopefully more than advice, wisdom. If you want the kind of marriage that God would have for you, then it's going to require a couple of things. Confrontation. Whoa, I don't want to, I don't like confrontation. All confrontation is, is not sweeping stuff under the rug. Have you guys seen that in relationships where you just sweep it under the rug? Or maybe the model that you had growing up as you looked at relationships was, we, we don't talk about stuff. We sweep it under the rug. Is anybody that, that, if your parents are here, I know you can't, you know, raise your hand, but... Uh, I mean, right? Sometimes that's the model given. And sometimes we're giving that to future generations and next generations in our own homes right now. All right? So you have to confront things. All that means is you bring up the issues that are actually there. All right? That's what that is. But also, you don't just confront things and bring up the issues. You also have to then forgive. 
So we're in a series on forgiveness. So what you do is you confront and bring things up, and then you forgive. You let those things go. All right. Now, a lot of times I've noticed, it took me a while, I would, pre- I would say this, and this is great, um, and then nobody would do it, because <laughs> it was hard. And if you confront somebody, and you tell a couple, hey, go home and confront the other person, what it feels like to the other person is getting smashed in an intersection or something like that if you're driving. It came out of nowhere. And so a lot of times what I tell couples is you should invite confrontation until you can get to where the other person can handle confrontation. So you invite it. Hey, how am I doing? Shauna, how am I doing at loving you? What could I do better? That kind of stuff. Now, we've gotten to the point, Shauna, just let me know. I mean, she'll tell me um, what needs to happen, and hopefully in our relationship, because we've been doing this a while, you can get to that point as well where you can actually bring things up and confront the other person. That is, it's not causing a fight. We have this negative view of confrontation. It's bringing up issues and then forgiving. We've got to learn to do that. So that's one of the most important lessons that I teach a young couple in premarital counseling. It is so hard to live that thing out. And there's a reason that it's difficult, all right? And so uh, I also talk about this uh, when I'm talking about marriage with a young couple. Um, And this is so important to learn. And I've used this visual before. In fact, uh, a couple of months ago, I did a series called Compassionate Conflict. And we talked about how to have conflict and how to, how to be compassionate in it. And I even referenced this visual uh, in that. And I'm going to bring it back today, uh, but I'm going to kind of change it just a little bit. So I brought with me today um, a husband and a wife, all right, represented in these balloons. And so what you want in your marriage is you want a relationship that doesn't blow up. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> So here's what happens. Tell me if this is true or not. At least give me, shake your heads or something or type an amen or yes or something like that into the uh, live feed if you're online. What happens in relationships is things happen. Uh, Words are spoken. Words sometimes are not spoken or sometimes words are spoken and then you should say something but you don't and so it becomes this thing that hurts the other person. So conflicts happen in relationships. Now, if you're the husband, right, in the relationship, the conflict happens, something negative happens. And what does it do? It's like blowing bitter air into your marriage. And so the wife does something, says something, right? And all of a sudden you're like, I'm not feeling so good about our relationship anymore. Now, what would happen if she continues to say negative things, hurtful things, she doesn't say certain things, she puts you down instead of builds you up, that kind of stuff? What happens is you continue to blow bitterness into your relationship, right? After a while, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to say to her, right? Back and forth. And so what happens in your relationship is, is the husband becomes bitter, the wife becomes bitter, And eventually, if you don't let that bitterness out, if you just keep blowing bitterness into your relationship, what's going to happen? These things are going to blow up, right? And we've all seen, or we're, some of us are at the precipice. It means we're at the edge right now. And our balloon has been so expanded by bitterness that we're about to explode. We're about to blow up on the other person. How do you let the bitterness out. Well, you bring it up, you confront it, and then you what? Forgive. Y'all ready for the sound? (laughs) It's what forgiveness sounds like. (laughs) That's good. That's what forgiveness sounds like. So forgiveness is letting the bitterness out of the relationship. And so when you forgive, You bring stuff up, and then you're able then to let those things go. But this is why it's so difficult. It's so hard to have a relationship where you both have these balloons that are deflated. And you want a deflated bitterness balloon, all right? You guys walk in here today, and if you're married, I could look out, and if, if everybody had a balloon, 
or you were a balloon, there would be all different states. There would be some I'd be like, get away from that couple, right? And that might be you. You're like, yeah, I'm about to blow up. She don't even know it. Or, you know, sometimes, like, she's about to blow up on you, bro. You don't even know it. And we tend to not know it sometimes, guys. That's why I think you should invite confrontation, by the way, and ask about that. But that's why this is so hard, right? This is real. This is like real life stuff. And here's what I'm here to tell you. If you don't learn to let that stuff go, your marriage will fail. And you've all seen it. And some marriages have failed in this room. I'm not to say that there's not, I'm not here to say there's not love and forgiveness and grace and all of that. There is. But if you're married right now, or if you are thinking about being married, it is so important to understand this concept so that you can learn to have a marriage that I would say God would have for you. Um, The reason we struggle with this is because we have a backwards view of forgiveness in marriage. Even Christians, very often, all right, I want to get into this, have a backwards view of forgiveness in marriage. What do you mean, John? Well, let me put something on the screen and you tell me if this is true. This is the way most of us view forgiveness in marriage. I'll forgive you if and when you deserve to be forgiven. I am not letting the air out of that balloon in our marriage until the time has come that you've suffered enough. (laughs) If and when you deserve to be forgiven. Man, this is good. Y'all, y'all are a good crowd today. Somebody go talk to the nine o'clock people, man. They were like, I'm expecting great response today, by the way, at the end of this. All right. Some things are going to happen. Good stuff. I'll forgive you if and when you deserve to be forgiven. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold this bitterness in until I get to the point that I, I've decided that it's time that I can forgive you. Some of us have been carrying around bitterness for so long. Now, let me pause here and say there are, and we're laughing because this is so real. Sometimes, (laughs) it's that kind of laugh, right? (laughs) You're like, man, some of you are like, later today, man, we're going to be talking. (laughs) Oh, gosh. You better go get that cookie. (laughs) But for real, let me pause here just a moment and say there's some serious stuff with this, and you all know that. Because sometimes we view forgiveness as letting somebody back in to hurt us. And there, there are some things that have happened to people. And there, there may be in this room where I, what I, I'm not saying that you, you let somebody hurt you. You let somebody walk on you. You let somebody abuse you either physically, uh, spiritually, emotionally. That's not what I'm saying. But forgiveness is, is still letting those things go for the benefit of yourself and the other person so that it doesn't hold you in bondage. And then you also have to decide, do I want God's best for this other person? That's a really hard question to answer. But the reality is you have to get to the place, you really do, even when you've been hurt, that I want God for your life. I want God's best. Not God, I want God to smash you. <laughs> I want God to show up in your life and change you. Right? So it's backwards to think that way, to say that somebody... Des, has to deserve it. Now, I'm, I'm here to tell you it's not God's way and it's not Christ-like. If you're here and you're like, I want a Christ-like marriage, most Christians here would say, I, I definitely want a Christ-like marriage. Christ-like. Yes, that sounds great. I want, my mar- I want to be like Jesus in my marriage. I want my spouse to be like, maybe it's the, I want my spouse to be like Jesus in our, in our marriage. I'm here to tell you, you're going to have to discover another way to forgive than they des- deserve forgiveness. Because that way is not going to work for you. Because you'll never get to the place where you just decide they completely deserve forgiveness. Because the next thing will happen, right? And then the next thing, and the next thing. And pretty soon, the balloon's blown up again. You're like, gosh, how are we here at this place again? So if you're a Christian, this is for you. If you're not a Christian, I think this is valuable. I think it's helpful, but I especially want to lean into those of you who say, I'm Christian and and I want this in in my relationship. Last week, we learned that when it comes to forgiveness, it's not about the other person deserving it. We, we, We discovered another way, and I'm going to lean into that just a little bit more today. 
you, you're going to have to figure out another reason, like we talked about last week. Um, we're going to have to lean into this understanding that in, in a relationship, especially a marriage relationship, there's got to be some other path to find forgiveness. Um, we're going to have to lean into our understanding of God. That makes sense, right, if we're Christian? We're going to have to under, lean into our understanding of who Jesus was and what he taught and what it really means to have Christ-like character. We're going to have to lean into that. We can't depend on culture. We can't depend on popular books or TV shows or anything like that to teach us how to love and how to forgive. We're going to have to go to Jesus and let him be our teacher. So I want to do that for the second part of this message today, all right? And I want to go to a guy named Paul in the New Testament. Paul was not a Christian. He became a Christian. And Paul writes about relationships. One of the places he does that is in the book of Ephesians. So I'm going to bring that up here in just a moment. But in the book of Ephesians, it was a letter written to first century Christians. It wasn't a, a biblical book at the time. It was a letter that a guy named Paul, who was a leader in the first century church, sent to a church in the town called Ephesus in the first century. They liked the letter so much because it talked about such real practical stuff that they said, we should send this down the road. And so it'd be like us getting a letter from somebody and we go, this is so good. And we send it down to Warren Grove Town. And we send it over to Macedonia on the north side of I-20. And we send it into Grove Town, UMC. And then we send it, we just start sending this letter everywhere. Like, you need to read this. That's how it happened. And pretty soon people were like, this is so good. It got, it became a part of our Bible. And so Paul writes about some stuff. He writes about marriage, but he starts by generally talking about relationships, you know, kids and parents and all kinds of other different kinds of relationships that exist in this world. And so here's how he introduces this whole thing. And this is leaning into what God says about how we're supposed to have um, Christian relationships, Christ-like relationships. He'll talk about marriage in a moment, but this is the general umbrella overview. He says, follow God's example, therefore. As dearly loved children, God loves you, you're like his children, and walk in the way of what? Hate, unforgiveness, bitterness? No, you guys see it, love, right? Just as, now notice this, Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And so in Ephesians chapter 5, when Paul is writing this letter to first century Christians, and the letters being circulated from church to church in the first century, they're struggling just like we do with relationships. So he's like, let me talk to you about relationships. As it, as it relates to relationships, what you're going to need to do is follow God's example. Not the world's example, God's example. You've got to follow his example. He gets right to the heart of it. I love the cross, because the cross is such a visual. I love balloons because they can be a visual that, that we remember. But we have crosses on the sides of the room. Y'all know what a cross looks like. But the cross is where Jesus died. And I think there's such an incredible illustration that I often bring up. Here's what he's saying. You have two kinds of relationships in this world. You have the horizontal beam of a cross, right? This, this part. And that's like marriage, that's like your friendships. That's like relationships in the church, coworker relationships, whatever. It's the side-to-side -side relationships. When you're looking at people, you're looking side-to-side, -side, right? You're looking eye-to-eye, -eye, looking across the table, horizontal relationships. What Paul says is we don't start there. If we really want to learn how to love and forgive people, then we've got to start not with the horizontal, but the what? Vertical. There is also a divine relationship. There's God in you, right? Follow God's example. So this godly example of the way God loves us. How does God love us? He sent his son who died on a cross for us. And so we have this divine example of God who sends Jesus to love us, to sacrifice for us, whether we deserved it or not, and we didn't. God sent Jesus to love you and to give his life for you. And he's like, so follow that example as it relates to relationships. Don't start with the horizontal. If you start with just my wife, my husband, you will not get to where you need to be. But if you start 
how does God love me? How does God forgive me? If I focus on that relationship, it's inevitable. At a certain point, you'll come to this choice. So I, I'm, saying it, I'm not saying it's inevitable that you'll love another person. I'm just saying it's inevitable you'll come to the place of choice. Will I love her or not? Will I love him or not? How am I going to live in my relationships in this world? It's either I follow God's example or I don't. Now, some translations, I love this, say imitate God. Instead of follow God's example, it's imitate God. Be imitators of God. So here's a question. Are you imitating God with forgiveness in your marriage? Oh, I don't like that verse. It don't apply to my marriage. Yes, it does. In fact, Paul's going to pick up on marriage here in just a moment. I'm going to read that part to you. But here in talking about all relationships, what he says is you, you don't imitate the world. You don't imitate anything else. You don't imitate your parents. You don't imitate. They, hopefully they do a good job, but that's not where you look. Where do you look? God. And I'm going to imitate God in my marriage relationship. The way God loves me, I'm going to love her. The way God loves me, I'm going to love him. But they don't deserve it. Doesn't work. You, you, you don't get to use that anymore when you're a Christian. I don't like that. We make Christianity way too easy in our culture. It is so hard to walk the path of Christ, amen? Because what it means is you have to forgive. You have to love. Again, I don't mean there aren't boundaries in certain situations, but the majority of situations, majority, this is the way of Jesus that we're supposed to live. <laughs> and we've, we, we, we don't get to just say, well, they don't deserve it. Neither did you when God forgave you, but he sent Jesus anyway to cover your sins and to love you and to show you that even though we don't for, uh, deserve God's grace, we receive it. Paul does talk about marriage later on. That was chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And so a little bit later, he actually talks about the marriage relationship. And he says a lot um, to husbands and wives, larger section for husbands actually, where he basically says this to husbands, by the way. Everybody always says I'm, I'm, I'm tough on men. Well, I, I am one. So, like, I, I get this about myself. Um, he says a lot to women, but he says a lot to men as well. And what he says to the man is you're supposed to die on a cross like Jesus did for your wife. Basically give up your life for her. So if I'm talking to a guy and something's going on, I'm like, dude, have you died on a cross for her? And, Come on, man, that's not, oh, no, it's real. So, wah, sorry. <laughs> like sometimes, and I, I'm serious, sometimes it's like, dude, get over yourself. Like Jesus died on a cross for you. And I'm not saying the issue is not important, not big, whatever, but if you want to get to a place where you have the kind of Christ-like marriage that you're really longing for, that everybody here really wants, I'm sure, it, it's going to begin by getting to the place where you can see Jesus first and what he did so that you can then give that to her. All right, so he, he goes back and forth with husbands and wives, uh, but then he says this one important thing. I just want to raise up one verse, verse 31. It says this, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife. So basically, uh, this is really important for you young folks, grow up. <laughs> That's leaving mom and dad. Too often we reattach to mom and dad. Mom and dad, let them go. When they leave, it's not helpful to the marriage to keep going back and telling mom what's going on with so, you know, we get some of that. That's a whole another message. <laughs> but you leave mom and dad. There's a growing up, a maturing. And then there's an attachment, this oneness that happens. The word, you become one flesh. I never understood that, but the word one in the Hebrew Old Testament, this comes from the book of Genesis, means complete. So for those of you who are my age, Jerry Maguire was right. You complete me, <laughs> Shauna. What a spiritual statement Jerry makes when he shows up in the room. And we all, you complete me. <laughs> I'm always like, yes. He doesn't even understand what he's saying. There's truth in, in 
popular movies and stuff. All truth is God's truth, whether it's known or not, it's truth, amen? I love that. And so the word one means complete, but isn't completeness difficult? Because, oh, it's this and this, and what do you mean we're complete? Like, I'm so bitter right now. Yes, and as you learn to forgive, you become more complete. And as she learns to forgive, you become more complete, right? He says, this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. And that's the part I really want to raise up and and help you understand. It's so weird. What's he talking about here? What he's saying, Paul is saying is, look, when it comes to the marriage relationship, horizontal, what you're getting is a picture of this. I find that so many of us don't understand that, even in Christian marriage. No one has ever told us, I'm going to tell you today, if you've not understood this, your marriage is a picture of God's love for people. You, I don't want that responsibility. Then do not get married. I'm serious. Because when we don't love... What we're telling the world is God doesn't love. No, God can overcome that. He uses this to point to this. It's just what he does. And so when I love Shauna, when she loves me, when we forgive each other, it's a picture of what God does for his people. Isn't that amazing? So you have a great opportunity in your marriage. You thought it was an obstacle. It's an opportunity to witness to the world, to your children, to the next generation about who God is. One of the best ways we can tell the next generation about who God is is to love our wives, to love our husbands, to show them marriages that point to the reality of who God really is. So I'm talking about Christ and the church. Now, I don't think I've ever used this verse before in a message. Maybe I have, but it was really interesting right before chapter five. And Paul didn't write, hey, here's chapter five of my letter. And the next, we, we put the chapters and verses there to help us find certain scriptures. But the very last thing Paul says before he goes, launches into this whole diatribe about relationships, ultimately about the marriage relationship, is verse 32. This is the last verse of the chapter right before what I just started for you. And look at what Paul says. He says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Y'all, if you read scripture, it's going to wear you out. Here's why. Every time you see a horizontal relationship mentioned, it's going to point to this. (laughs) It's always you do this because God did this. Isn't that, I mean, just over and over and over again, what we find is the horizontal is a picture of the vertical. Everything from Paul here, the entirety of biblical teaching, if you read the story of Scripture over and over, you're going to find this reality that it's always going to point to the divine relationship. Um, We don't start with us. This is why I tell couples, too, like, look, you, what, you do not want a self-centered spouse when you get married. Everyone's like, amen, I don't want my spouse to be self-centered. You don't even want a spouse-centered spouse. But well, wait a minute, I want them to be centered on me. No, you don't. You know who you want them to be centered on? Because if, if, if somebody is centered on God, if they get this right, they're going to eventually begin to get this right. I'm not saying it's not difficult because, bro... <laughs> and the sound of forgiveness. <laughs> but if you will focus on this, it impacts this. We start with Jesus first and his forgiveness. Um, I wrote this down. I want to I read it to you um, about marriage. It's, is, is this, is that forgiveness isn't granted because the person deserves it. Think about that for just a moment. That's coming in a minute. Forgiveness isn't granted because the person deserves it. It's an act of mercy and grace covered by love. I want to read that again. Forgiveness isn't granted because the person deserves it. You don't give forgiveness to your wife or husband because they deserve it. It's an act of mercy and grace covered by love. So mercy is not giving somebody what they actually deserve. They hurt you, you want to hurt them back. Mercy is when you say, I'm not going to hurt you back because you hurt me. 
Grace is just the other side of the same coin, and it's when you give somebody something they don't deserve. Wow. So I don't give you what you do deserve, and then I give you what you don't deserve. You're like, isn't that saying the same thing? Kind of. They're both good. And that's all covered in love. So you don't grant, you want another way to, to forgive. It, it's not going to, deserving won't work because it, it just won't work. So in marriage, if you want to learn how to forgive, you're going to have to go, okay, I'm going to have to wrap grace and mercy in love. I'm going to have to give somebody what they don't deserve. I'm going to have to hold back what they do deserve. But listen, that's what Jesus did on the cross. He gave us what we don't deserve, eternal life with him, a relationship with him, a second chance, a thousandth chance. And then he didn't give us what we do deserve, eternal damnation and hell and everything else. And he gives us heaven instead. Are you excited? I mean, isn't that amazing that God loves us that much? That's what God gives us. That's what he gives us is grace and mercy. Yet then I won't give grace and mercy to you. In Christian marriage, we've got to learn that that's the way that God would have for us. Um, there's something really cool when we put this up there. Forgiveness allows God to show up in you and shine through you. Oh, man, that's good. Forgiveness, when you forgive, when you let the air out, it allows God to show up in you. By the way, he's in you if you're a Christian. He, he puts his Holy Spirit in you. Can't be a, a Christian without the Holy Spirit. I didn't know the Holy Spirit was in me. He's in you. If you're a follower of Christ, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. You're marked with his presence, the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus said, I'm leaving. It's better for you that I leave this earth. I've been here 33 years, but now I leave my spirit with you. And his spirit came into people. I've been reading the book of Acts and over and over and over and over. You have this God who shows up inside of people. And when he shows up inside of you, he then wants to shine through you. And one of the best places, the Holy Spirit is beating at your heart right now to try to shine through you. And one of the best places it can happen is in your marriage, y'all. You have no idea that your son or daughter might need that today. You have no idea that a coworker is watching and going, I'm going to see how they deal with this. Because, you know, Christians are supposed to be different. Yeah, right. We are. It's a witness. It's a testimony. This is why it's a picture of God's love for people. Do you want a Christ-like marriage? So here's my last thing I'll say to you with that. If there's any hope for my marriage to be Christ-like, it's when I act like Christ. <laughs> I write things down that I just go, duh, this is way too simple. So that's showing up right now. If there's any hope if you go, I want a Christ-like marriage, well, if there's any hope for that, guess what? It's when you act like Christ, when it comes to forgiveness. That is so profoundly simple, so difficult to live out. Because right now, wife, you have some bitterness. And you're waiting until he deserves it. You ready for the sound of forgiveness? You got to let that go. If you want it to be Christ-like, husband, same thing. It's when you act like Christ when it comes to forgiveness. See, you are viewing this whole thing as, you're like, man, my marriage is such an obstacle. No, it's an opportunity. You have a great opportunity today to let God show up in you. He's already there if you're a follower. If you're not a follower and you're like, I need God in me because I can't do this, you've come to that realization, I'd say to you, amen, that's true. And you can have God in you today. You can say yes to God. Young people, it's so important to say yes to God <laughs> if you really want to be able to do this well. If you want your marriage, Shauna and I are 27 years into this, if we want our marriage to be a witness to Christ, if, then we're going to have to allow God to show up in us and then shine through us as we continue to live in this world. We don't have it perfect, trust me. We do not have it perfect. Shauna, I thought I'd get an amen from that corner over there. I mean, <laughs> but we have to work at it and work at it and work at it and work at it and forgive and forgive and let go and let go. And when we do that, 
the world can see Jesus. So you have a great opportunity in front of you today. And I want to invite us to a time of response. I'm going to invite you, if you would, to stand if you're able to do that. Let's stand. You all been sitting a while. I'm going to pray. And I'm just going to kind of, I just feel like let's just leave this open. I'm going to pray for us. I'm especially praying for those of us who are married. I want to pray for the young people in the house today or watching online too. Uh, And I want to say this to you. Um, After I pray or even as I pray and we move into this final song in time of response, some people may need to come bow a knee. That last song we sang, this is my surrender. Surrender. Maybe you need to grab your spouse. You might have to. Let's go down there. Forgive me as you're walking, right? (laughs) Because she don't want to go with you or he doesn't want to go with you right now. But I don't know. Maybe just as an act of commitment, bow the knee, surrender here. Um, If you need somebody to pray with you, we've got people. I'm going to stand at the side too. And we would love to pray with you or over you by yourself or with somebody if it's for your marriage. Or if you're a young person, go, I want that. Will you pray that for me? Will you pray that that would be my path? We'll pray over you for that as we sing this last song today. Give your offerings to God. We take offerings during this time as well. But let's sing and worship and let's do this. Let me pray. Jesus, we come before you and, and, and God, this is our surrender. We're laying it down. God, if there's any hope for Christ's likeness in our relationships and especially our marriages, it's when we act like Christ. It's when we behave like him, especially when it comes to forgiveness. God, I pray there be some forgiveness in this room happen today. Otherwise, we've just had a church service or just another religious ceremony. And that won't get us anywhere. God, we need your spirit more than anything today. Help us forgive. Help us ask for forgiveness. God, for um, I just feel compelled to say and to pray over young people in our church that they would choose this path in this way, even if they haven't seen it. God, that they, they would say, I want that for my life. So, God, I pray over them and and pray for generations to come who who will allow you to show up in them and then shine through them. God, help us be a church where, where people who are broken, who have bitterness, can let it go in forgiveness. We pray these things in, in Jesus' name as we sing this final song and as we continue to surrender to you in, in his name. Amen.